Thanks, Gordon. Well, I appreciate it, and good morning to the swarm. I uh, greatly appreciated the toast that you made last night to the CNO's design because I think we're going to do some high velocity learning, sure. learning this morning. But funny you should say that. Yeah, I very much pine for my, my time back at sea. Unfortunately, all my ships that I was actually serving on have either been decommissioned or are on their way out the door here. But I guess I'm showing my age, uh, just like the ships that I served on. Uh, I also appreciated uh, Mr. Sanger's speech last night. And uh, I thought it set a really good geopolitical context. And I was reviewing your speech with some of my staff, and I was talking to Joe Dorenzo, who I understood you had the opportunity to ride on the bus back with last night from that great dinner. By the way, that great dinner was over the top. I mean, that was really super. But uh, he said that you were not aware that we actually had a Coast Guard cyber strategy. So I'm personally delivering you a copy of our Coast Guard cyber strategy. And not only, not only does the Coast Guard have a cyber strategy, but as I'll talk about a little bit later, I think the Coast Guard is actually, of all the federal agencies, uniquely positioned to be able to operate and succeed in cyberspace. And it goes to the actual creation of the organization by Alexander Hamilton. So Alexander Hamilton, through his wisdom, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, actually set the Coast Guard up to really be a premier agency to operate in cyberspace. And he did that all the way back in 1790 when the organization was created. So we'll talk about that a little bit later, how Alexander Hamilton was cyber aware back in 1790. But uh, really good opportunity to be here, and thank you very much for allowing the Coast Guard to kind of lead this. I like to think that Coast Guard got the lead here is because we want all the rest of the conference to actually look at the world through a Coast Guard prism, you know, so you can actually get your worldview correct and, and get everything put in that direction. So thanks for the opportunity to cede the ground. Oh, I agree, okay, we'll cede the ground. I'll take every opportunity to demonstrate the unique value of the Coast Guard. And what I wanna do is uh, ultimately show you our four strategies that we have in the Coast Guard, which we think the Coast Guard adds unique and enduring value to the nation, and how all those are lashed up through the cooperative strategy, and how all this stuff fits together. And uh, so we'll proceed there, and we got to, uh, Begin here by paying tribute to the man, okay, Mahan, and we've got a quote here about these uh, great highways that our nation have, or wide commons. Um, I also didn't read the other 800 pages. I only pulled this. <laughs> I only pulled this one quote out, but I, I thought it was particularly appropriate. And I, I would argue that you know the United States maybe sometimes doesn't think of itself as a maritime nation, but I would say that perhaps the defining characteristics of our nation from a security perspective is these great oceans that we have on both sides, and they're really really good because they provide you with connectivity with the rest of the world. So for legitimate trade, and they're also great defensive mechanisms. I mean they provide real defense for this nation and we're really blessed because we've got largely peaceful neighbors to the north and the south and we've got these vast oceans that allow us to take advantage of globalization but also act as unique uh, barriers or defensive mechanisms you know to be able to protect our nation I know you said every sort of military threat can be taken care of at sea I would argue that many of the security challenges you know that are not symmetric, but the asymmetric security challenges can also be taken care of because of these great oceans that we have on both sides of our country. And I think Mahan understood that. Another guy who understood that, since we're talking about fathers, I know Mahan was one of the fathers of the Naval War College. So this is the father of the Coast Guard, Alexander Hamilton. He's a happening guy right now. Did you know, anybody seen the uh, Broadway production? Anybody seen it, kind of a rap opera? I haven't actually seen it yet, but we in Coast Guard like to think that you know his creation of the Coast Guard was part of what led him to the superstardom that he now has uh, out on, uh, on Broadway. But this is the, uh, the father of the Coast Guard. And uh, you know, we're in the election cycle right now. Anybody know that we're not having a presidential election? It's kind of rough and tumble, kind of rough and tumble. Anybody know how Alexander Hamilton died? He was shot by the Vice President of the United States for basically calling him a liar during the election campaign of 1800. So if we think we got rough and tumble politics today, you know, where they're throwing verbal assaults at each other and F-bombs and all this other stuff, these guys were actually shooting each other back in the day. So he was killed, yeah, killed by Aaron Burr. Um, the Vice President of the United States kind of makes the Dick Cheney incident where he hit the guy in the face with a shotgun blast while shooting quail or whatever, do kind of look tame in regard. <laughs> What's that? Is that Dan Quayle? Oh, it wasn't Dan, it may have been a relative of Dan Quayle, it was Mr. Quayle, but. Uh, 
So Alexander Hammond, also a popular guy. Everybody know he's on the $10 bill? Yes? You guys don't ever see the $10 bill? Well, Alexander Hamilton is on the $10 bill, for those of you who don't know. But he's only, he's, he's only on the $10 bill now temporarily. Does anybody see that, that there's actually a proposal to have him replaced? Anybody know who's going to replace him on the $10 bill? Yeah, a, a woman, to be determined, is, uh, is uh, what the proposal is. And this actually became an electoral issue in our presidential uh, election. If anybody's been watching the debates, this actually, the issue of who's going to replace Alexander Hamilton on the $10 bill is actually an election issue, and it may be very important to you when you go out and cast your vote. So let me just read this article from the uh, Washington Post, and this is dated September 17th of 2015. The title of the article is, Jeb Bush Wants Margaret Thatcher on a $10 Bill. Brits are bemused. That's why I'll be talking to my UK colleagues over here. Here's what it reads. It says, one of the most puzzling moments of CNN's GOP debate was when Jeb Bush named Margaret Thatcher as the woman he'd like to see on the $10 bill. At the end of the three-hour debate, after covering topics veering from the nuclear accord with Iran to U.S.-Russian relations, moderator Jake Tapper threw the contenders what appeared to be a softball question. Earlier this year, the Treasury Department announced that a woman will appear on a $10 bill. What woman would you like to see on the $10 bill? Oh, Sharon Stone, okay. <laughs> All right, we got that one. Okay, we'll, we'll take a vote afterwards, and I'll make sure that those are submitted to the Treasury Department for due consideration. All right, here's a quote. I would go with Ronald Reagan's partner, Margaret Thatcher, probably illegal, but what the heck, replied the former governor of Florida. Upon hearing that Bush had plumped for the former British leader, British Twitter follower Larry the Cat responded, quote, Jeb Bush has suggested putting Margaret Thatcher on the $10 bill. Maybe Donald Trump isn't so bad after all. <laughs> then it goes further on. It says, Bush's answer certainly stood out from those of the other 10 contenders. Carly Fiorina said she wouldn't change the bill. Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz went with Rosa Parks. Rand Paul picked Susan B. Anthony. And Scott Walker opted for Clara Barton. Chris Christie picked Abigail Adams. John Kasich said Mother Teresa. Mike Huckabee chose his wife, and Ben Carson chose his mother. Donald Trump chose his daughter, Ivanka. So if you're a single uh, issue voter and you want to see Ivanka Trump on the $10 bill, then you should vote for, for Donald Trump. But anyway, ongoing controversy. So Alexander Hamilton, father of the Coast Guard. Here's, here's the, the issue that Alexander Hamilton was confronted with. He was the first Secretary of the Treasury after the passage of the Constitution in 1789. For those of you who know the history, we came up with the Constitution because the Articles of Confederation had failed largely because there was no way to fund the government. It was by voluntary contributions from the state. So one of the first things that Alexander Hamilton as Secretary of the Treasury was confronted with is how do we pay our bills? Back in those days, what was the number one method for funding, for funding the federal government? Tariffs. Okay, so we raise tariffs to raise revenue. Guess what ends up happening? People smuggle. People smuggle. They don't want to provide the tariffs. They don't want to go to the customs house and they don't want to pay their, their tariffs. So Alexander Hamilton comes up with a bright idea to develop what's called the Revenue Cutter Service. Purchase, advocates for the purchase of 10 vessels to protect our, uh, our ports from smuggling activities or our country from smuggling activities. Now think about this from a, uh, uh, the situation we was in at the time. Remember the Navy had been disbanded. At the end of the Revolutionary War, the Navy had been disbanded. And it had been disbanded in part because they did not want to see us get involved in any type of foreign intrigues. And they felt like having a Navy around would actually do that type of stuff. So Alexander Hamilton, when confronted with this challenge of how do we get rid of the smuggling problem, decided to essentially create almost like a Navy, certainly a federal naval force. Now think about that from his perspective. Why didn't he just go out and buy some more customs officers who could go out and patrol the beach? You know, instead he went for the, the Cadillac solution here. Think about this, there was no naval force at, at all. And to buy these big capital assets, to train the individuals who are necessary to operate these assets, to put those individuals in the faces of the perils of the sea, why in the world would Alexander Hamilton ever advocate for something like that? Why didn't he just hit the easy button and just get a bunch of customs guys on horseback to go out there and ride on the beach? Anybody have any ideas why not only he would advocate, but actually he succeeded in getting the Congress to agree to him? Because if you can understand that question, you can understand why those oceans that we have on both sides of our country are so valuable to us. 
So anybody have any notions why he would choose to build a naval force with all the things that came along with it? Because of states rights. Is it states rights? States rights. The fact that states are saying we can't have a federal jurisdiction up and down the coast? Uh, that actually, I, I don't think that was actually part of the reason that they did it because I think they had that actually sorted out by, via the Constitution at that point. Well, yes. Yeah. And so the idea of having absolute control, or at least some sort of policing control over the local maritime economy was critical to the economic success. And, and Hamilton's coming out as first secretary of the treasury, so he's very sensitive <coughs> to both currency markets as well as trade, yep. the means of securing assets into the, into the economy. We were dependent on tariffs essentially to pay the bill because we had no income tax. Yep. And so essentially he has to get this under control and have some sort of a disciplined policing action over to make sure that revenues continue to flow to the federal treasury. Yep, and, and that's exactly right, is this was ultimately about funding the federal government via tariffs and preventing smuggling problems. Let me just take this down to the tactical level, why he would want to do something like this. Think about what you get when you buy a naval force. You get the ability to actually go out and seize the initiative from the adversary instead of waiting for them to just sort of pick whatever beach they're going to be able to land at. You also get the best use of sensors available at that time. You know, some guy in a, in a uh, crow's nest with a spyglass. But think about that. You've actually got control of a very large space from just that, that type of visual sensor. Plus, the adversary on the other side, you get his boat, you get his concentrated goods for shipping, you get a view inside his smuggling network and all that, all that pertains there. If you're just sort, going to sort of wait for them to deliver things on the beach, you can never have the initiative. The adversary always decides where they want to land. You know, that's what you get in a continental power like Switzerland. If you're Switzerland, you don't have these great oceans to protect. You just wait for things to come to your border. And the adversary always has the initiative. They're operating from foreign territory. But these oceans that we have on our sides provide us with this tremendous tactical advantage to actually control that battle space. But it requires ships in order to be able to do that. And he asked for 10 cutters, all of which were built in 10 different congressional districts. Every single one of those cutters was over budget and behind schedule. <laughs> but he created a naval force that endures to this day. And it has a number of characteristics that are unique in the federal inventory. And it all becomes, a, it all becomes about because of the creation of this organization to be able to stop smuggling activities. So the key attributes of what he created in the United States Coast Guard is he created an agency that is military and law enforcement and regulatory and these other things all at the exact same time. People have said it's like a paramilitary force. It is not a paramilitary force. It is a military force that is also at the exact same time as a law enforcement agency. And that is one of the key aspects that Alexander Hamilton created. And it, and it goes all the way back to the creation of the Revenue Cutter Service. Because remember, there was no Navy at that time. This was the nation's naval force. So later, the, uh, the Navy was created in 1797, 1798. Anybody know why our Navy was recreated? I'm at the Naval War College, yeah. <laughs> That's perfect, and, and, you, and that's exactly right. It was a quasi-war with France and French depredations when we decided we were not going to pay the post-revolutionary government back their debts, and they were out there grabbing, grabbing U.S. ships and also the Barbary pirates. That's exactly right, and they were created for that. But the Coast Guard, well, Revenue Cutter Service at that time, actually operated during the quasi-war with France and also operated against Barbary pirates and did, has fought in all the nation's wars that have had a maritime component ever since then. And it's also provided law enforcement functions ever since 1790 when Alexander Hamilton created the Coast Guard. So you really do have a very unique instrument here with some different characteristics that don't exist anywhere else in the government. And what I'd like to spend the rest of my time, what I want to show this is, so I'm not going to be talking mostly about symmetric cooperation. So what I mean symmetric, I'm talking about nation state war. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that area, although the Coast Guard, like I said, has fought in all the nation's wars. I'm going to spend the bulk of my time on the rest of the Coast Guard portfolio, which is all the asymmetric pieces. So this is law enforcement, counterterrorism, piracy, regulatory activities, environmental protection, and all the rest of that stuff. But we also operate in the symmetric realm as well, as you can see from this slide. 
So here's the cooperative strategy. And my personal opinion is this is light years above its prior version. You can ask questions about that if, if you have a different view. But in my opinion, a much more mature document and a much more responsive document to today's set of challenges, which are really a mix of sort of symmetric things and asymmetric things, as I talked about before. And this strategy is kind of set up in that direction. So when you starts in the global security environment here at the top, it talks about both those symmetric and asymmetric challenges and how maritime forces, whether they be law enforcement forces or military forces, can begin addressing those problem sets. Then there's a heavy international component, which I can tell you is just a reflection of the world that we live in today. And I can tell you the United States Coast Guard and any of our international pieces almost never operates alone. It operates with partners, and every single one of the partners here, I know the Coast Guard has a, an oar in the water, particularly with Columbia. I mean, we have been working together for many, many years. Same thing with the UK, Australia, and, and everybody else on the different problem sets. So I think that's a, that's a really wise thing to actually lead with in that document, because almost everything today is done through international coalitions, and I can describe the reasons why that is. Then we have the various different types of activities that were out there. The, the two I want to focus on are all domain access and maritime security. The other ones, deterrence to a certain degree. Power projection and sea control, that's kind of on the symmetric side of the house. And then the last part I think is also extremely wise about uh, flexible forces. That's where we're at in the Coast Guard. Very uh, fiscally challenged and the ability to attract talent and buy the right equipment to actually get at the mission sets is absolutely vital in today's world. There's no question about it. So here's the four areas, four strategic areas that the Coast Guard is focusing on. And we've focused on these areas ever since uh, Admiral Zukunf took over almost two years ago. And he's been focusing on these four strategic threads. And there are four strategies to address these strategic threads. And why were these threads chosen? Each one of these threads were chosen for the Coast Guard is because these are areas where the Coast Guard adds often unique value to the nation. And these are enduring uh, strategic threads that are going to carry on for many, many years. And all four of these uh, strategies are actually threaded up through the cooperative strategy. And I'll show you how they all kind of fit together. But that's the reason why these four things were chosen. So the first one is on the Western Hemisphere, and I don't have to tell Admiral Barrera anything about this, but we've got some serious challenges here in the Western Hemisphere. And the border security that, uh, discussion that you're seeing in the presidential uh, race is a symptom of the instability that exists here in the Western Hemisphere, largely created by transnational criminal organizations. This is an area where almost all the threats are asymmetric in nature that exist here in the Western Hemisphere. There's no real serious threat of nation-state war here in, in the Western Hemisphere, but I can tell you there are nation-states right now fighting for their lives and their existence because of the existence of transnational criminal organizations, largely fueled by the drug trade, but also engaged in human trafficking activity and other things. Anybody see we had 50,000 unaccompanied children show up this, at the southwest border? And that is a symptom of the instability existing in, in uh, Central America. Can you imagine if you're in a country like El Salvador, which has a murder rate, I think last year, of about 105 per 100,000, it's 5 per 100,000 in the U.S., where you, as a parent, make a decision to rather to turn your child over to a coyote, a human smuggler, rather than live in a country like El Salvador. That should concern each and every one of us. And that's where you hear things like build a border wall and make the Mexicans pay for it. And, uh, all the other things that come in there. And I'll talk a little bit more about the Western Hemisphere strategy. The Arctic. So lots of things happen in the Arctic. The admirals and I were talking this morning. There, anybody know there's a 1,500 passenger cruise ship that is actually going to make the Northwest Passage this summer? Uh, the minimum price for like an interior room on that is $20,000 a passenger. So. They're, they're making big bucks on this. We'll, we'll see more of this in the future. But you can imagine this. How much SAR infrastructure is there in the Northwest Passage? How much environmental protection stuff is there in the Northwest Passage? If a ship like that got stuck in the ice, how many icebreakers are there out there to be able to take care of? And there's a whole other world of uh, increased shipping, uh, resource exploitation activities, and a bunch of things in the Arctic. Anybody read the Navy's Arctic Roadmap? So, my take on the Navy's Arctic roadmap is, ah, we got other priorities, that's a long way in the future, and, and that's kind of it. That's my personal opinion on it. When you read the Coast Guard actually has an Arctic strategy, we're right there in the middle of this thing. 
We've been in the Arctic since 1867 when the territory of Alaska was purchased from Russia. We were there from day one operating in the Arctic. And this will be a continuing demand signal for the Coast Guard. Okay, here's the icebreaking fleets, just some, some ones here. So Russia has over 40 icebreakers, including some nuclear ones, 11 under construction. United States has one 40-year-old rehabbed icebreaker, heavy icebreaker, and that's, that's it, and a medium icebreaker called the, the Healy. We're actually looking to construct, and we've got $150 million in the President's request, a new heavy icebreaker for operations in the Arctic and Antarctic. So I had to just read this one article which came out over the weekend because the British are actually building an icebreaker, a polar research vessel. And uh, here's the article and it says uh, they, they've actually crowdsourced the naming of their icebreaker. Yeah. yeah, so here's what happened. It says the good news for the natural, and this was over the weekend, the good news for the Natural Environment Research Council's decision to crowdsource a name for its later Polish research vessel is unprecedented public engagement in a sometimes niche area of scientific study. The bad news, sailing due south in a vessel that sounds like it was christened by a five-year-old who has drunk three cartons of Capri Sun. <laughs> just, just a day after the NERC uh, launched its poll to name the 200 million pound vessel, which will first head to Antarctica in 2019, the clear favorite was research vessel Bodie McBoatface with well over 18,000 votes. This is a true story. NERC's website kept crashing on Sunday under the weight of traffic, showing dozens of serious suggestions connecting to inspiring figures such as Sir David Attenborough or names such as Polar Dream. But the bulk of entries were distinctly, distinctly less sober. Aside from the leading contender, ideas included, it's bloody cold here, what iceberg, Captain Haddock, Big ship, isn't it? <laughs> Science, and my favorite, big metal floaty thingy thing. <laughs> so anyway, just a little humor there from, from our colleagues across the pond. But that's the state of the nation's icebreaking fleet. Really a long and sad story as to why we find ourselves where we do with the icebreaking capability. On cyber, so here's Alexander Hamilton on cyber. If you can just very quickly, the Coast Guard is the only federal agency that operates substantially on .mil, .gov, and .com. .mil because we're a member of the DODEN, military member. .gov, we're a member of the Department of Homeland Security and have law enforcement responsibilities. And .com because we're a regulatory agency responsible for all the, the cyber uh, infrastructure in the nation's maritime transportation system. Which I can argue, the, the maritime transportation system is probably one of the most complex uh, systems that exist out there because it's international, intermodal, just in time, carries all different types of products, whether they be people, petrochemical products, and so on and so forth. And the Coast Guard really is uniquely positioned in that regard, plus we're a member of the intelligence community and we bring all the stuff that goes along with being a member of the intelligence community. And we have a cyber strategy, which you have a copy of, that actually addresses all that. Okay. Energy. Tremendous changes in the world's energy situation. I would argue, I don't know, David, what, what your view, this certainly has energy and energy production, movement of energy products has to be probably within the top three ge global geopolitical drivers. There's almost no question about it. And technology there is going gangbusters. I'll just give you one example. You know, 15 years ago, there was no real liquefied natural gas market. It was very expensive. It was kind of a local market. Now there's a global LNG market. And guess who's one of the largest producers of, of natural gas? is now the United States and a, a net exporter, going to be a net exporter of natural gas. Imagine the implications of that when you know, Russia is currently reliant for natural gas, or Europe is currently reliant on Russia for natural gas. You can imagine the geopolitical implications. And almost all these energy products move by water. And the Coast Guard's got an oar in the water on all those different things, as well as development of fracking technology, deep water drilling, a whole bunch of things that are happening in this energy space that will change the entire geopolitical picture as we go forward. We also have a human capital strategy. I'm not going to take too much time on it, but this is responsive to that part of the cooperative strategy where it talks about building flexible forces. Certain uh, of these strategies, cyber for an example, that probably is not going to be one just on technology. That's going to be one on human capital and the gray matter exists in between people's ears. The ability to Recruit, develop, and retain that workforce will be a challenge for all the military services going forward. No question about it. 
Okay. So let me show you how these things work. We were blessed to have a commandant come in and said, I want strategies to drive my organization, every part of my organization, all my operations, all my budget, everything else. And he directed us to create these four strategies, unique areas where the Coast Guard can add value and enduring areas uh, where the nation will continue to be able to focus on. So we developed all four of these strategies. All of them look the same. They're, des they're uh, designed the same in their lines of effort, and they're designed to actually work together. So the Western Hemisphere strategy, you can see the three basic lines of effort, combating networks. That's network-centric warfare, but on an asymmetric matter, like against transnational criminal organizations, where your end game's typically not a smoke and hole in the ground. It's a law enforcement action, including collection of evidence, pulling apart the networks that, that, uh, that work in that area. Securing borders, these are extended border concepts, like making sure you can pr protect your borders from things way out, way out into the ocean spaces before they actually come in there. And then safeguarding commerce, which talks a lot about energy development and some other things. The Arctic strategy, improving awareness, modernizing governance, and broadening partnerships. Almost everything that's done in the Arctic is driven by the environmentals there. Very little infrastructure, all of it done by partnership, all of it challenged by what's actually going on up there, including the ability to communicate and operate as teams. That's what the Arctic strategy is about. Cyber strategy, we talked about the unique positioning of the Coast Guard, three basic lines of effort there, defending cyberspace, and that means the Coast Guard relevant cyberspace, enabling Coast Guard operations, and then lastly, protecting infrastructure. That's all about the marine transportation system. And then the last one is on the energy action plan. And this is all about making sure we've got the capacity and competency to operate and not be a hindrance to all the regulator, as a regulatory agency to all the energy activities that are occurring out there, whether it's development, transportation of, of energy products, and so on and so forth. And all undergirded by human capital strategy. And all these strategies are designed to dovetail together. So for example, in improve, if you make an investment in improving awareness in the Arctic, you can take that exact same thing and apply it to combating networks or enabling operations in their cyber strategy. All designed to work together. So for a small agency like the Coast Guard, this actually provides strategic effect to my organization, allows my organization to fulfill these strategies in a coherent manner and bring them all together. And then the last part, Every one of those strategies you can thread up through the cooperative maritime strategy. So when you read the Coast Guard pieces that are in that strategy, Coast Guard unique pieces, whether it's Western Hemisphere contributions or Arctic, it's threaded up through that strategy. So uh, it's, an, like I said, chosen for areas where we think the Coast Guard can actually add unique value to the nation in those four strategic efforts. And you'll see that threaded through the entire strategy. So, the last part, we think we're a unique instrument of national power designed by Alexander Hamilton to be such and that we're responsive and relevant to today's world because we can operate with symmetric forces, symmetric naval forces, but we can also operate in all that asymmetric realm. So where your end game is not a smoking hole in the water. It is a law enforcement action, an intelligence action, so on and so forth. Each one of the strategies of the Coast Guard design is designed to be enduring and to showcase the unique value that the Coast Guard brings to the nation. And all four of those strategies are designed to dovetail with the cooperative strategy and work their way up so that we can become part of a coherent naval force for the nation. So again, we incredibly blessed nation with these giant water spaces on both sides. They provide us with advantages that almost no country on earth actually has and our ability to operate as naval forces together across the entire spectrum of, of conflict or security challenges, all the way from you know, basic small smuggling challenges, all the way up to nation state warfare, uh, I think is a, a, an incredible opportunity for us to do that. And I'm incredibly proud to stand with the other sea services in this document, because I think that it is really a demonstration of not only what our naval forces bring to the nation, but leverages those, those key oceans on both sides to the benefit of our country. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Yes? Morning, Admiral. Uh, Captain P.H. from the U.S. Special Operations Command. Uh, last month or so, I sat down actually with uh, Captain Aaron Roth, uh, who's the head of the CAG. Yep. Uh, very sharp individual, and we were talking uh, about <coughs> our, our various documents. Um, 
does it bother you uh, in the sense of that, <coughs> that the U.S. military is not paying more attention to the uh, trans-regional criminal organizations um, and is spending a little too much time on the four and not necessarily on, on the one and uh, th those criminal organizations that are enabling capital flows and, and doing so uh, uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the download. Do you think we should need, do we need to put more emphasis uh, on DOD, on, uh, on those kind of organizations? Uh, I think the answer is yes, increasingly so, because those organizations become more sophisticated every day. And when you look on the President's Declaration on Transnational uh, Organized Crime, it actually declares certain of those organizations to be a national security threat. And I can tell you for nations in the Western Hemisphere, nations like Guatemala or Honduras, it is the number one national security threat. It's not a law enforcement problem for those people. It is, a, uh, it is an existential threat. And even beyond those small countries, think about uh, in Mexico, who's taken down Chapo Guzman every single time? And who killed Trevino Morales? And who killed all the other bad guys that they got down there? It was not a law enforcement officer. And, that's exactly right. It was the Mexican Marines. The Mexican Marines on the streets of Mexico taking down these uh, transnational criminal actors because there's no, all their federal law enforcement has either been out corrupted or outgunned. And that should scare the heck out of everybody. That's one of our major trading partners right next to us who has to bring their military forces out in the field to be able to get these, get these guys and capture Chapo over and over and over again. So that's, that's how we roll. But, Yes, absolutely so. I showed you that picture uh, uh, on my Western Hemisphere strategy. Do you see that vessel there? That's a semi-submersible vessel. Prior to these bad drug guys getting enough capital, enough experience, to, only nation states would have operated platforms like that. Admiral Brera and I were talking about whether fully submersible vessels exist. Has anybody been to Jadif South and been through the 3D virtual tour of the uh, fully submersible vessel? They've got fully f submersible capability. Think about that. A transnational criminal organization is with those attributes of a nation state. I can tell you, you know, not every one of these things is a, uh, I think should be binned in the national security category, but there's a number of these, an increasing number of these sophistication of transnational criminal organizations that can constitute national security threats. Like that semi-submersible, is there a role for DOD? I can tell you there's no law enforcement agency out there at all that has the capability to detect and monitor a, a semi-submersible vessel. It doesn't exist. Our taxpayers have only uh, invested one time for that type of sensor capability, and that's on our, our Department of Defense. So there is definitely a role there. There are some uh, constitutional or other lines we need to think about. You know, should DOD really be in law enforcement problems? I mean, there's a, a whole body of work there. But I think there is increasingly a role in that area because with globalization, Increasing sophistication of these transnational criminal networks, their ability to rot governments from the inside out. Yeah, there's a real, real area increasingly so for military forces to be able to operate in an area. Where the lines are, you're going to have to get it, you know, you're going to have to see at the end of the day where those lines, because there's some very important lines there and things that law enforcement agencies do and things that are set aside for military forces, but an increasing role. Yes, Lee. Lee Corder from Australia. Um, thank you for your eloquent overview of the, of the Coast Guard. Um, one question that popped out as I was listening to that is, and in, in the context of the US maritime strategy, where does the Coast Guard fit into the, the pivot to the Indo Asian yeah. Pacific? Because you really didn't mention any of that. Yeah. That 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 actually is intentional, and I, I appreciate you raising that question. It goes to the design of the strategies. Coast Guard's only about forty thousand people; does not have a lot of capacity to do this. Our commandant has a basically a standing request to provide forces out to to PACOM to work on the problem sets. Think about the the relevance of the Coast Guard in an area like the South China Sea. My opinion uniquely oh, relevant. Yeah, exactly. Let me show, anybody see how the Chinese, what are the Chinese leading with for their ships that are around those little uh, Great Wall of Sand islands? Yeah, and the Coast Guard, they're civil agencies, and they understand the value. I think their, their use is masterful for two reasons. One, it's a great optic when you get a white thing that says China Coast Guard, and oh, by the way, they stole our stripe too, so they even brand themselves after. 
after the Coast Guard. But I think even the more masterful part about it is, it is a statement from them saying, these things are so much our territory, we don't even have to send our Navy out there. We'll just send our Coast Guard out there to do this stuff. I think it is an absolutely masterful use of the Coast Guard. And uh, we could do the same thing. That's in the national kit. Admiral Zukunft has been asked that question, and he said, I got my hands full in the Western Hemisphere and in the Arctic and all the other Coast Guard mission sets that we got. There ain't enough Coast Guard to go around. So unless somebody uh, comes up with some additional resources and so on and so forth, that uh, he's not willing to commit to that, that set yet. But you can see, this is a, a tool that's in the national kit. That's why I think it's, so, it's, it's a great lead in with Coast Guard, because this is a unique agency that can be brought into a bunch of different areas. And the Coast Guards are the ones who are out there, by and large, doing the, the business down in the South China Sea. Of course, and, and in that engagement, cooperation idea, I mean, many of the smaller navies and so on around the, you know, the Asian Pacific region, and in, I guess in South America and elsewhere, are going to have more in common with the Coast Guard than with the, the big gray navy that is around. Yeah, I'm in, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. I'd say, I don't know, 12, 15 countries around the world may have relevance with a, a real true blue water navy but almost everybody needs this basket of constabulary activities that that exists there so we're highly relevant to lots of different nations we had sent small teams all around the world but again there's never never really enough coast guard to actually go around quick on it don't feel too bad about 40,000 i mean my navy has about 13,000 sales so yeah. keep it in perspective yeah i keep it in perspective <laughs> yeah thanks Peter. I, don't know, I don't want to bring it to uh, a less pleasant topic, but I've been around long enough to talk about national fleets. And yeah. We've seen what's happened with the LCS and the Navy yeah. and the National Security Cutter in, in your service. Um, what do you think about the future provision of force structure for both services? Are there commonalities? Are there ways to collaborate better? Is this necessary to provide the kind of force structure to do both the home and the away games? Yeah. What's your thinking about that? Yeah, well. So National Security Cutter is the best ship that the Coast Guard has ever fielded. Uh, and for those of you who actually follow the issue, Congress gave us a ninth NSC. The Coast Guard didn't ask for it. And now there's cocktail circuit for a tenth NSC. But the NSC is an incredibly effective platform. I do, my personal opinion, I do believe there was a missed opportunity there between LCS and the National Security Cutter. We just couldn't get the Venn diagrams to, to come together. Um, I would, like I said, lots of advantages, but I'm having commonality between our two, our two services. But, you know, when the Navy builds ships, you guys have your category of things you want to go to, and Coast Guard has its category of things it wants to go to. And I wish we could have actually put those together, because I think it was kind of a missed opportunity. But having seen the negotiations, I wasn't in the negotiations directly, but having seen the negotiations from afar, it's just kind of too far apart. I think the Navy just had a little bit different vision for its ship than the, than the National Security Cutter. But I will say on the National Security Cutter, is Nick Price in here? Prime. Or Nick Prime, I'm sorry, Nick Prime. We were having discussions last night and Nick was saying, the number one ship that the United States needs to build more of is the National Security Cutter. And for many of the same reasons that we talked about. So I know Nick, you'll have to be on a panel later to talk. Yes. Adam, my name is Brian McGrath. Uh, I would like to push back I'm not sure that China's use of its non-military naval force necessarily is an argument for us to do the same. Fair enough. Uh, there are nations in the region that do field Coast Guards and navies uh, that seem probably more well positioned to provide that symmetric uh, tit for tat approach uh, as as our two services face a, face a common foe, which is these restrictive budgets, yeah. it seems to me that uh, minding our own knitting might be uh, something that we should be concerned with. I recognize that the Coast Guard has a great many jobs that it is poorly resourced to do. I don't want to add that South China Sea mission to that list. You know what I mean? uh, it's, it's a question of how you want to do things. If, if you know, the navigation rights and things that we have said are important to our nation, if we think that those can be taken care of by Japan Coast Guard or Vietnam Coast Guard or Philippine Coast Guard. Or the U.S. Navy. Or the US Navy but, you know, 
like I said, in my opinion, the optic that China has put out there, they're not putting their gray holes out there. Maybe they're over the horizon somewhere, but they're not putting their gray holes out there with water cannons and doing all this stuff. They're putting their Coast Guard out there. And my opinion, I think that actually gives them an advantage in the, the, prop, the way they frame the problem set. Whether we would want to do that and with our own organic naval forces, Coast Guard naval forces, is up to us. It's a tool in the national inventory. But, I mean, that's a value judgment. You know, if, if you're comfortable with the way things are right now, which is the U.S. Navy and, you know, whatever foreign Coast Guards you can put in there, that's fine. I can tell you Admiral Zukunft has said that we're not going to be sending any Coast Guard ships down there absent some change in, you know, resourcing and, and some other things to do. It. Yeah, I think it's, well, and none of our strategies focus on that. It goes to the question, why didn't you guys put that in strategies? Because these are the ones we're putting all our effort to right now because there ain't nobody else there. Like in the Arctic, there ain't nobody else there. In the Western Hemisphere, there largely ain't nobody else there. And in the other areas, I think we add unique value. But yeah, but I don't think it should be lost that this is part of the national toolkit and under the right circumstances should be considered. Sir, my name is Tyler Jones. To further this discussion, what exactly would the Coast Guard do in the South China Sea and how would it be better uh, optically yep. than the Navy? Well, that's what Admiral Zucumps has said. I'm not, I'm not sending any naval forces down there until I see the CONOP. And there hasn't been any CONOP put out on how those things would be used. But think about it just from a FON perspective. Maybe you want to send a naval destroyer through there. Maybe you want to send a Coast Guard cutter. It sends a little bit different message when you think about the way that you're shaping things. And if you're in a, uh, a situation where people are taking pictures of each other with water cannons and stuff like that, do you want that to be a China Coast Guard vessel on a gray hole? By the way, China Coast Guard's not in queues either, which is an interesting situation. I could talk to you more about that. But what do you want your optic to be? That's, that's part of it. And I can tell you, you know, some of the stuff is being played out in the court of public opinion. You know, we think that naval rights and stuff like that are played out just amongst lawyers and things. A lot of it is played out in the court of public opinion. And how are you leading as a nation? And what type of optics do you want out there to be able to do that? So the answer to your question is, I need to see the con op too and how we would use it. And it goes to the, goes to the question, this is an option that's available in the national inventory. Right now, the option's not being taken. But I think it's very interesting that all those countries down there are largely not fielding their navies. They're fielding their Coast Guard. They got a Coast Guard cutter, China Coast Guard cutters, 14,000 tons that they built. These are, these are huge vessels. And their Coast Guard is many times the size of the, of the United States Coast Guard. In the number of vessels, it's probably four times the number of vessels that the Coast Guard has. And their EEZ is 1 17th the size of the United States EEZ. I mean, these countries are serious about this. And we have to ask them, ask why are they engaging in the activities? I assume because they think it gives them an advantage to be able to do so. Sir, Christian Smith, I come from U.S. PACOM, and, and so I'm, I'm very interested in the inventory uh, conversation. I, I believe, personally, that there is a huge role for the Coast Guard in the South China Sea, not least of which because many of the nations we wish to engage with through the recently announced Maritime Security Initiative are far more induced by cooperating with Coast Guard vessels because their interests reside in the maritime domain awareness arena. Right. Uh, where I think you are perhaps as good or better practitioners when we start talking about policing EECs. I also believe there's some inherent risk to over militarizing the approach to security cooperation in the region. Uh, with that in mind, how do you think the Coast Guard can buy down risk outsourcing this mission to the U.S. Navy? How can we buy down risk out? Based on yeah. the practitioners who, who probably have more applicable tools in the South China Sea with the way we wish to shape the security environment. Yeah. To not over militarize. Yeah. We only have at our disposal naval forces. As right. As you've told us. How right. can the Coast Guard then buy yeah. down the inherent risks? Associated? Well, and we've, been doing, and we've been doing a lot of sort of lighter footprint stuff. So we've been engaged in foreign military sales. So some of the big flagship fleets from the Philippine Coast Guard our ex-Coast Guard cutters. We also send MTTs down there to deal maritime training teams or mobile training teams to go down there, talk to them, build capacity for law enforcement or search and rescue or environmental protection or command centers and all the other stuff. So some real light footprint stuff. Plus we operate forum like the North Pacific Coast Guard Forum. Is everybody familiar with that? So that brings China, South Korea, Japan, Russia, the United States and Canada together actually in a forum where Coast Guards 
work on missions. It's almost unheard of, particularly with the participation of the, the Russians. So we bring that light footprint connectivity. Uh, we've got a liaison officer in uh, Hanoi who works with the Vietnam Coast Guard. So we do a lot of light footprint stuff. We haven't been putting the naval forces, Coast Guard naval forces down there, but we've been engaged in the region actually for a long, long time, building uh, trust in the area, building expertise and competence and all that, and, that, and that'll continue. You know, whether there should be more of that, I guess it's up to uh, people who fit the bills to pay. I want your role to go unrecognized because the way you were pitching it, it wasn't as if you were there, but I happen to Yeah, we're not, there, we're not there with the white holes. No, you are there very well. Yeah, we're, all, we're there in a bunch of other light, light footprint modes, as you know. Okay. Uh, I, I hate to cut you off, and I know we can go the two days with your wonderful presentation. Uh, so we appreciate you deeply coming. The Admiral is going to be in the area for a little while. Yeah. Uh, so all those did not have a chance to ask questions, uh, please hit them up over coffee. But please join me in thanking Admiral Michelle. Thank you.